Contrast can be a great tool to make something stand out against the backdrop that it's its opposite. So I have this picture up here of this multicolored umbrella. Well, you might not notice there, but there's a whole bunch of black umbrellas that are there as well. Uh, that, it, it stands out anyways because it's multicolored, but with all of those black umbrellas there, that stands out even more. Looking at contrasting characters in a novel, for example, help this heroes to stand out. So one of the books that I read uh, every few years is I read the Lord of the Rings series. Uh, and I like the movies, but I, I really like the books even more. Uh, and uh, part of the beauty of the, uh, the Lord of the Rings series is, is that you have this contrast between these, these wicked, evil uh, antagonists and then the goodness of, of the heroes in it. And that's done on purpose so that we see uh, that these are more uh, these are more of the type of things that we should emulate in our own lives, these good characteristics. Well, in the section of John that we're going to look at this morning, we're going to see a woman who is performing truly one of the most beautiful acts that we find in all of John's gospel and really throughout the New Testament. Her act of devotion is made all the more beautiful when we look at it within the backdrop uh, contrasted against other characters who do some very ugly acts of self-centeredness. So we're going to examine this, uh, this passage this morning looking at John, uh, and we'll look at the end of John, John chapter 11 and then look at the beginning of John chapter 12. Uh, but we're going to ask this question this morning. This is the question that we're going to answer as we, we dig into this. Is We're going to ask, how should we show that we truly value Jesus? How, how do we show that we truly value Jesus? You know, Jesus has a way of exposing what people truly value in their life. It's one thing to say that we value something, that something is valuable to us, but you know, Jesus has a way of having that come out, that, that, that we can see. Even for those who outright reject him, he has a way of showing what those people truly value. For example, those who reject Jesus, those who just outright reject Jesus, do so because they value something or someone more than they value him. And that can be a plethora of different things, but ultimately when it comes down to it, those who reject him say, I value these other things more than I value him. As believers, we value Jesus because we know that he alone is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. Paul puts it even better than I could in Philippians, as he says in Philippians chapter 3, but whatever I have gained, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul recognizes that there is so much more worth in knowing Jesus than anything that this world has to offer. And yet, the reality is that a battle rages within the heart of believers that tempts us to value things of this world over, or even at times, uh, at the same level that we honor Jesus. And those things can threaten to displace Jesus in our heart. We don't do it on purpose. Nobody who displaces Jesus with things uh, of this world says, uh, wakes up one morning and goes, you know what, I want to love this other thing as much as I love Jesus. I want to love this other thing more than I love Jesus. It happens. That battle rages within us, and, and slowly but surely, we tend to slip into this idea of, of valuing things at the same level or greater than Jesus. So this morning, we're going to challenge to consider how much we really do value Jesus and examine each one of our lives. Really, one of the things that we do, and a really good job that we shouldn't do in the church at, is we, we keep things at, at, at arm's length. We talk in, in philosophical terms a lot of times, and we don't personalize it enough. So this morning, I want to really invite you to, to personalize it. Is there anything in my life that I could be valuing as much as Jesus, or even more so than Jesus? And really do a, an honest uh, reflection of yourself, or are there things that could potentially get to that point? So that's what we're going to think about this morning as we look at, at a text that might seem like it's disconnected from one another, but you'll see my flow of thought as we go through this. So we're picking up in John chapter 11, where we left off last week in verse 45. It says, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary uh, and had seen what he had did, and that, by the way, is what he did was raising Lazarus from the dead. It connects with what we looked at last week. It says, Many of them who believed, uh, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them that Jesus, what Jesus had done. 
So the chief priests of the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this by his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, not only for the nation, but also to gather uh, into one children, uh, the children of God who were scattered abroad. So from that day, they made plans to put him to death. So what we find here is that after Lazarus is raised from the dead, some believe. Some said, hey, this guy's got to be the Messiah. Others immediately went to Jerusalem to tell the Pharisees what happened. Now, it's amazing to me when I think about this text of Scripture. These people had just watched a man who had been dead for four days be raised to life, and they still don't believe. Imagine the hardness of heart that there is. No matter what evidence is presented to some people, they're never going to receive it. Now, the religious leaders gather an informal gathering of what is known as the Sanhedrin. Now, Sanhedrin is not mentioned in John's Gospel, but we see that in the rest of the Gospels, is that this idea of the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was what really uh, the supreme court of the Jewish land. They were ultimately the arbiters of how the law was to be interpreted. Now, they, they have a professed concern. When they get together, they have a professed concern and then a deeper concern that I'll talk about in a second. Their, 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 their professed concern was this. If, we, if these people start believing that Jesus is the Messiah, then the Romans are going to get upset, which would lead to us losing both the temple and our land. We would lose everything. We strove, we strove to have the temple once again, to have our land once again, and if the Romans get upset, if they think that we're following this Messiah... They're going to come down on us. Well, why is that? Well, it had to do with the Pax Romana. The Pax Romana, the Roman peace, was the way that the Romans controlled uh, the lands that they conquered. They would take a place like Israel, a place that was known to be uh, a place that was a hot, uh, a very hot button area where it, where it could ex explode into riots at any particular time. And what they would do is they would give them the feeling of self-governance. They would allow uh, them to have their own king or they would allow them to have some of their own leaders, or their own, in this case, Supreme Court. But really, when it came down to it, they had that autonomy as long as they did exactly what the Romans wanted them to do. So it was a fake autonomy. It was, we'll let you do what you want to do with your religion or with your country as long as you do what we want. And if you don't, if all of a sudden we see the signs of rebellion, then we're going to come down on it with great viciousness through our military force. And so that's what they say their concern was. They're concerned that if the people start following Jesus as the Messiah, that the Romans are going to catch wind of it, they're going to see it as a rebellion, and they're going to put it down and destroy both the temple and their land. Now, ironically, here's the ironic thing about this, is that they're going to work all really hard to try to avoid that, but just a few years down the road in AD 70, that exact thing would happen. A rebellion would start, the Romans would put it down, they would destroy the temple, and they would take the, the, the uh, leadership of positions away from the, the religious leaders of that day. So they, that was what their professed concern was. But they had a real concern, a concern that's kind of behind the surface. And their real concern had to do with their position and their authority. Because ultimately what it came down to is their position and authority was at stake. The Romans had a habit of removing people out of positions who didn't play ball with them and putting others in there. The religious leaders were really concerned about their position. They didn't want to be removed from those positions of power they wanted to continue their positions of power because not only were they in this position of authority, but they were also financially benefiting from that. So they were afraid that they were going to lose their positions of power. So then Caiaphas, the man who was high priest, he speaks up. 
Now, if anybody knew what a tenuous position uh, that they were in, it was Caiaphas. You see, Caiaphas, there was three other high priests that came before him, between him and his father-in-law, Annas. But all of them served for a very short amount of time because they crossed Rome. And when they crossed Rome, they were removed. Caiaphas, though, he was a very politically minded person. He actually served as high priest longer than anybody else, about 18 years. So he was able to, through political maneuvering, stay in that position for a very long time. Now he makes a point here, and the intended point that he makes is, it would be better for us and for the people, but especially for us, it would be better for us and the people if we just killed Jesus. That's his logic. And that makes sense to them from a, from a Jewish sort of position. Well, of course, if this one person dies and it's going to protect the whole nation, wouldn't that be better for the whole nation? That's their logic. Now, the challenge with that is, is first of all, it ignores Scripture. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 15 says this, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike uh, an abomination to the Lord. And that's exactly what they were doing. They were condemning the righteous. They were condemning the righteous. Now, unintentionally, though, what it tells us here in this text that John brings out to us is that he unintentionally actually prophesies about Jesus' substitutionary atonement uh, for not only the Jews in Judea, but the Jews that were in the dispersion, meaning that they were outside of Israel, and even for the Gentiles. So without even meaning to, without even really understanding the full depth of what he's saying, he's actually right. It was better that one would die for all. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Caiaphas just didn't get it at this point. What did they say? A broken clock is right twice a day? That's what's going on here. Let me get to our first point. Our first point this morning is this. When we truly value Jesus, we will not allow our wants and ambition to drive our response to him. Again, when we truly value Jesus, we will not allow our wants and our ambition to drive our response to him. I was asked a great question by a friend this week. And he asked me the question, he said, is ambition a sin? It's a good question. Is ambition a sin? Well, the easy answer is no. Ambition in and of itself is not a sin. The challenge comes up with unchecked ambition. Ambition that's purpose is self-focused. For the religious leaders, for Caiaphas, their ambition was self-focused. It was about how can they benefit? Ambition that leads the believer to focus too much attention on the things of this world and not enough on being a follower of Christ will always lead to all manners of sin. We see it in, in religious organizations all the time. People start off on the right track, and then all of a sudden they get ambitious, and they start to think about all the things that they want to do, and they kind of create this, this, or, the, 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 this, this, this place that, that really glorifies themselves. And then they miss the entire point. Unchecked ambition can certainly be a sin. And that's the point here. We cannot allow our personal wants and our ambition to be the driving force behind our response to Jesus. Can't just be about our wants and our ambition. The religious leaders in Caiaphas had already made up their minds about Jesus. That's why they came to the point that they did. They, they weren't even open to hearing something different than what they already thought. When they thought about Jesus, he didn't fit with what they wanted in the Messiah. And he went against their ambition because he called them to a completely different lifestyle. They didn't want to know anything about it, so they weren't interested in hearing anything that he had to say. And their issues really weren't theological. That's one of the fascinating things. They hide behind theology sometimes, but the arguments that they have with Jesus are not based on theology. Their issues were because he was a threat to their status quo. They benefited from the status quo. They benefited from the way that things were. So they didn't want to know anything about this Jesus. They wanted things to stay the way that they were. That's why they were concerned about the Romans coming down on them. They were benefited. This would drive them to taking part in the most heinous act of evil ever committed, condemning Jesus to death. 
So we always have to, to, to keep in mind that unchecked wants and unchecked ambition are a, are a pathway to evil. Keep those in check. Next, let's look at verses 54 and following. It says, Jesus therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews. He went from there uh, to the region of the wilderness to a town called Ephraim. And there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many of them went up to the country, uh, uh, to Jerusalem, before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think? That he will come to the feast after all, or at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that, he might, uh, so that they might arrest him. Now, let me just say real quickly about these texts of Scriptures. I will be back to these texts of Scripture in the future. We're going to take a little bit of break from John. We're going to, we're going to have a, a VBS focus for a while, and we're going to do a couple of other. We're going to do a, 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 a section on prayer. Uh, uh, after that, and then after that we're going to spend a little bit of time in the Old Testament looking at the Ten Commandments, but we'll come back to John, uh, because as this builds up, this builds up to the passion of Christ. And so at the beginning of the new year, we're going to focus a lot of attention on there. So what I want to do with this text of Scripture is I want to say, we read it, let's put a pin in it for right now because we're going to come back to it, because this really is, the, the, this is the, 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 the line of demarcation, or the part where there's changes that are going to come between Jesus' ministry and now Jesus' passion. And that's where we'll spend our time at the beginning of the year really putting a lot of focus in into Jesus' passion there. Okay? So let's jump into chapter 1, uh, or chapter 12, verse 1. Look what it says. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those who were reclining at the table with him. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he was about to betray him, said, Why was it that this ointment was not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Jesus said, said Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. When a large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only uh, on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So it was the Friday before Passover. Jesus is with Lazarus. Martha and Mary having a celebration, and that celebration it doesn't say specifically who it's for, but it's very likely that it was both for Jesus and for Lazarus. None of these people here really understood that this would be the beginning of Jesus' last week on earth. They didn't know that, or at least in his, uh, in, in his bodily form, the way that he was uh, before, the uh, before the resurrection. They didn't know that he was about to die. But they're having the celebration likely to celebrate that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. We learned from Mark's gospel something interesting, that this actually didn't take place inside of, of Lazarus and uh, Martha and Mary's home, but it actually took place in a house of a man named Simon the leper, who we, we, we was very likely somebody that Jesus uh, healed. Okay, And that's why I find it so fascinating, because what do we find Martha doing? Martha serving. Okay? Martha was serving. It's fascinating to me, it wasn't even her house, but she was serving. Now, Martha is the focus here, neither is Lazarus, but I do want to just mention real quickly that it's always fascinating for me to see Martha, because when we see Martha, most of the time in Scripture, she is busy serving. And there's a point where she kind of comes into a conflict, a little bit of a light conflict with Jesus about that, but that's not really the focus here. The point is, is that Martha is busy serving people even when she's not in her own house. And as I thought about that this week, I thought to myself, you know what? Every church needs some Marthas. <laughs> Every church needs some people who we know, oh, she'll take care of it. She'll make sure that that gets done. I, I say she, it doesn't have to be a woman, but in my experience, it's always been somebody like that. 
Somebody that I know, you know what? That person's got it taken care of. They don't want to be up front. They don't want me to mention their name Janet from the pulpit or anything like that. <laughs> but we all need people like that because they get things done. That's what's Martha. She's just busy, busy doing that. Lazarus is busy living his life, probably telling everybody his story about how he was dead for four days and now he's raised again. I imagine that when, when Lazarus was starting to speak up, people were like, oh, he's got the best story. I know, your story beats all of ours. None of us were dead for four days and are alive again. So he's busy living his life. But then Mary does something beautiful, and that's really the focus that we need to, to, to focus in on is what Mary is doing here. She anoints Jesus, and we find this both in, uh, in, in, in John's Gospel, we also find it in Matthew and Mark, that she comes and she anoints Jesus' head and his feet with this very expensive ointment. This expensive ointment actually comes from India, so it was an export that came in, very fragrant import, and it was very valuable. The bottle of spikenard, in fact, that's what it's called, spikenard, is probably a fa family heirloom passed down from generation to generation. And if they used it much, they would just use a very little bit of it. it, it Judas says that it's worth 300 denarii, and if that is true, that means that it's about one year's wages for a laborer. So if we put it in moderate equivalent, it probably at that time was worth about $10,000. So an expensive perfume. And she pours it on Jesus and she anoints his feet. Why does she do this? Well, it brings us to our second point. When we truly value Jesus, we put honoring Jesus above worldly possessions. When we truly value Jesus, we put honoring Jesus above worldly possessions. I have no doubt that this was Mary's most valuable possession. We don't know whether she was rich or not, but I, I have no doubt that this was a valuable possession. But yet she pours it on Jesus to honor him. Truth be told, Mary didn't even understand the significance of what she was doing. As I said, she didn't know yet that Jesus would die. She didn't know, as Jesus says, that she was preparing him for burial. She had no idea what all of that meant at this point. She just does it because she thankful, she's thankful to him. Jesus has not only loved her and cared for her, but he rose her, her, her brother from the dead. She's pouring out her thanks to him. She's showing her love for him. And because she recognizes that Jesus is the most honored guest at the table. Yeah, she loves her brother. She's thankful for her brother. The party might be for her brother, but she recognizes that the honored guest at the table is Jesus, and she, she wants to honor him. You know, unfortunately, in a world where we can have anything we want at the click of a button, as instant as we can want it. In fact, I don't know if you've heard this, but, but in some places now, Amazon, if it wasn't enough that you could go, I can literally stand up here in front of you, pull up my Amazon app on my phone, order something from Amazon, and have it at my house in two or three days. Imagine that. Remember the old days where you actually had to get in the car and go to a store to get something? And sometimes they didn't have that something, so you had to do what? Go to another store. Now we don't have to do that. But I've even heard that Amazon now is playing around with the idea of getting drones. And drones will actually get your package from wherever they are in Amazon warehouse places Get a drone, have that drone take the package to your house and put it on your porch. That's crazy. That's craziness. It's kind of scary, too. I've watched way too many sci-fi movies, and I'm like, what if the drones turn on us? What kind of a world will it be in? Unfortunately, we live in a world where we can have whatever we want, whenever we want it. And, and for many people, worldly possessions have often become what life is lived for. It's about those worldly possessions. Most of us would like to think that we own our possessions, but in many cases, our possessions own us. And it shouldn't be so. Now I'm going to move for just a second here, and I'm giving you a warning. I'm going to move away from preaching, and I'm going to get into meddling for a second, okay? You've been warned. I want you to do something that I did this week, and it's not easy, but I want you to do it this week. Not here this morning, 
Because it's easy to put on our church smile at church. But do it this week. Sit in your house, somewhere in your house, and look around. Look around the things in your home. And ask yourself the question, what do I know in my heart of hearts, something I might not even admit to anybody else, but I know in my heart of hearts that I would have a real tough time giving up if God called me to give it up. When I wrote this, I was in my, my office at home, which is called the Bat Cave. Okay? Now, if you've been in the Bat Cave before, I've got my stuff in there. And I like my stuff. I got my comic book collection, which is extensive. I've got my collection of G.I. Joe action figures, which take me back to my childhood. I've got my, my Blu-rays, and I ask myself that question. What of these things would I be willing to give up if God called me to go on a mission or something like that? And it was easy for me to go, oh, I would give it all up. But then a little voice in my head said, would you now? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I could put it away in storage. No, 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 no. You know, the reality is, it's very easy for us to say, I surrender all. You know that old hymn, I surrender all. But I wonder how many times we say, I surrender all with our fingers crossed behind our back. <laughs> I surrender most. Most to you I surrender. Lord, to you I surrender most. All right, enough meddling, right? Some of you are like, move on, move on. <laughs> Third point is this. When we truly value Jesus, we are willing to endure the scorn of others in our devotion to him. Again, when we truly value Jesus, we're willing to endure the scorn of others in our devotion to him. Mary does a couple of things here that were no-nos in her culture. It might not jump out to us right away, but it, but it was no-nos for the people in the room. For one, as we saw with Judas, she, she wastes this expensive ointment. Instead of conserving it, instead of using it for something that they saw was proper, she wastes it. And, and it, 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 it shows us in Scripture, she uses the whole bottle. She uses it all. Judas thought it was a waste. And in fact, we find from the other Gospels that the other disciples thought so too. But not only that, she takes the role of a servant. She gets down and washes Jesus' feet. That was what was done by a servant. And it would have been seen for her as a woman to be doing that in that culture as something that was proper. And then, if that wasn't enough, she actually lets her hair down in public. Now, those of us who are American are like, so? Well, of course, in our culture, it's fine. No woman walks in our church and has her hair down, and we go, oh, scandal! Okay, we don't do that. In that culture, though, it was seen as very scandalous for a woman to have her hair down in public. She does all of these things that she had learned from childhood would have been unacceptable for her to do, but why does she do it? Well, it's because the love and devotion that she has for Jesus is greater than her concern about the way people will perceive her. Her love and devotion for Jesus goes beyond how people might see her. Sometimes we're tempted in this life to fit in, to not offend people, to not be canceled in the modern lexicon, or to hide our light under a basket. But what does that attitude say to Jesus? Jesus, I'm so proud of you. Unless anybody knows that I'm proud of you, then I'm going to kind of keep that on the DL, okay? <laughs> now, we don't have to be obnoxious in the way that we show our devotion to Jesus. We don't have to be in everybody's face. We don't have to be walking around trying to quote Bible verses and hit people over the head all the time, although quoting Bible verses can be very helpful. We don't have to be obnoxious about it. At the same time, though, it shouldn't surprise people that we know that we follow Christ. It should bother you if you're talking to somebody, and after a few months of knowing that person, people go, oh, I didn't realize you were a Christian. Oops. No, people should know, because we, we react differently to things. We spend time doing things that are different. And hopefully, we'll take time to tell people about the love of Christ and what he's done in our life. I had to tell you. When you, if you get to know me, if you don't know me and you, you get to know me, within the first 15 minutes, you will learn some names. You might not be able to remember those names, but you're going to learn the name April. Because to know me, you have to know my wife too. We're a package deal. 
And so within the first 15 minutes of most conversations that I have with a new person, I talk about my wife, April. You'll also get to know that I have four kids. And you may even know their names, because I talk about them all the time. In fact, some people will like to talk about them too much. Why? Because they're that important to me. But here's the reality. Sometimes we're willing to do that with our family. Talk about our family. How much more important is it that people know about the Lord that we love? April has changed my life like very few people on the face of the earth possibly could. But Jesus has changed my life more. April has had a greater impact on me than any human being on the face of the earth. But Jesus has had more impact. Jesus loves me better than any other person has ever loved me on the face of the earth. But Jesus loves me even better. People shouldn't be surprised that we follow Jesus. And if that means that that's going to offend them or bother them, they're going to look down on us, so be it. So be it. Fourth, when we truly value Jesus, our devotion to Him will have an impact on others. When we truly value Jesus, our devotion to Him will have an impact on others. Don't miss a couple of things here. The house is, it says that the house is filled with fragments. Have you ever had anything like that spill in your house and the whole house smells like it from top to bottom? Sometimes that's a good thing. Other times it's a bad thing, right? Our dogs, every once in a while, will go out into the yard and find something stinky. And because they're dogs, they don't just go, oh, that's stinky, I'll avoid it. They say, oh, that's stinky, I'll roll in it. And what's the first thing they do? Run in the house. Mom, Dad, look at the great smell I found. I smell like this. And we're like, get out. Where's that? Yeah, it's just, it, it, it smells up the whole house. In this case, it was a beautiful fragrance, and it was all over the house. You could smell it as soon as you came in. Sort of like right around uh, Thanksgiving time. And April starts making the turkey, and I'm outside, and I come back in, and I just am overwhelmed with that smell of turkey. I'm like, oh, it's going to be a good day. <laughs> Mary's hair was even filled with the fragrance, as she actually was using her hair to wipe Jesus' feet. So everywhere Mary went, she would have smelled as the fragrance. And then looking within our larger context of the story, the Jewish leaders not only want to kill Jesus, as they've stated, but they also want to kill Lazarus as well. Because people are coming to believe Jesus because Lazarus is alive. So Lazarus, just because he died and was raised to life, now they want to kill him. Guess what? Lazarus never says one word in Scripture. But yet, he's such an enemy of the people, according to the Jewish leaders, that they even want to kill him. You know, all of us, all, all that reminds us of this. No matter what, when we live a life that values Jesus and is devoted to following him, we will have an impact on people. In some cases, that will be a positive impact. In some cases, people will love having us around. Other times, people will see it as a negative. Either way, when we genuinely follow Jesus, when we have an impact on others' lives, because it colors the interactions and the behaviors that we have with people. It does. Jesus has influenced me so much that how can it not influence the way that I react to other people? Jesus loved me when I was unlovable, so how should I love people who are unlovable? I should try to strive for the same thing, right? Shouldn't I try to love the way that he does? A lot of times, you know, we, we have those things where we see people come in that, uh, that, that kind of drain us a little bit, and in our head we're like, oh no. i got to put on my smile, everything's good, but in our head we're going, oh no, not them. Imagine if Jesus did that with you. Oh no, not you. No, we wouldn't want to do that. No, our interaction with Jesus should color the way that we interact with other people. In short, we should all want to smell like Jesus. We should all want to smell like we've been with Jesus, right? I want people to notice, hey, this guy's been with Jesus. Now, of course, there's not going to be there. Hey. 
But that's the idea. We want, we, want, we want to exude Jesus so much people go, I know this guy's been with Jesus. <coughs> Finally, fifth point is this. When we truly value Jesus, we will not attempt to hide our true motives behind false devotion. When we truly value Jesus, we will not attempt to hide our true motives behind false devotion. Judas gives a plausible argument to cover for his false motive. He says, we should have taken that bottle and we should have sold it and given the money to the poor. That sounds like a good point. That even sounds like a religious point, doesn't it? And it would be if it doesn't come from a heart that was completely and totally false. He didn't mean it in the slightest. John, in fact, tells us that Judas was a thief and he used to help himself to the money in the money bag whenever possible. What does Jesus do? He rebukes him under no un says unnecessary terms. When he says, leave her alone, that's sharp. Now Jesus doesn't at this point reveal the depth of Judas's deception because the reality is, is Judas still has a role to play. But he defends Mary because Mary is the only one who is truly honoring him. See, Judas wanted people to believe that he was honoring Jesus through this statement about helping the poor. But Judas was really only interested in helping himself. When I was in seminary, I read a book called The Subtle, Subtle Power of Spiritual Abuse. It wasn't a how-to model, but it was a book that really was talking about how oftentimes in church people will use spiritually abusive language to get what ultimately they want. So give some examples. Somebody comes to me, Pastor, God's been telling me this. Oh, really? God's been telling you it, but he's not speaking to me at all. Has God really been telling you that? Maybe he is. Let's pray about it together. People will often use that. Or, here's one of my favorites. People come up to, to and I'll hear them say, whether it's to me or to somebody else, they go, you know, a lot of people are talking about this. You know what that usually means? That means my wife and I and my cousin, we've been talking about it. But it's used in a way to go, oh, if a lot of people are talking about it, I better do what you want. So when somebody comes into my office and they go, you know, Pastor, I've been praying, and I really think that our church needs this ministry. I'll say, it sounds like God's working on your heart to lead that ministry. Congratulations. <laughs> well, no, uh, no, 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 I meant you, Pastor. <laughs> Beloved, here's, the good, here's some good news for you. God has never called a person to be the Holy Spirit in your life. The Holy Spirit does a good job of that. We can trust His leading in our life. Or, or somebody say, well, God would have us do this. Sometimes it's true. Scripture is very clear. God would have us do certain things. But just because somebody says God would have us do that doesn't mean that God is actually saying it. In fact, oftentimes, what God wants a person to do in that situation is exactly opposite of what they would do otherwise. When something is truly of God, we don't need to convince godly people that it's right. Because godly people will pray about it. Godly people will seek scripture in it. Godly people will patiently wait upon the Lord to find those answers. But we don't need to use manipulation tactics, plausible words, plausible arguments, hide our true motives behind other things, because it's just deception. Well, there's much more that could be said about this text, but as I look at Mary and Mary's example, just reminded that in the end, we need to live as a people who truly value Jesus. So my question stands that I asked earlier. Is there anything in your life that could potentially get in the way of your value of Jesus? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for your grace and your goodness. We praise you that you are far above anything that we could ever value on this earth. Lord, help us to value you as you deserve. And Lord, if there's anything in our life that is tempting to take that place, to share that place, or to overtake that place in our hearts, Lord, I pray that we would confess that, that we would turn to you, and that we would give you our full heart. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.